Welcome to Bloom Church Online, everybody. My name is Brittany and I am the Communications Director here at Bloom. And it is an honor to share this time with you, to have you joining us for our service today. Whether it's your very first time or whether you call Bloom Church your home, Welcome, we are so glad that you're here. We are currently in the middle of a sermon series called Hearing God, where we're learning all about how to recognize God's voice in a world full of noise. So I wanna encourage you to really lean in and listen, take notes if you can, and let's learn and grow together. Let's go ahead and get into today's service. The number one reason people don't receive godly voices is because they have something called pride that is blocking them from the wisdom God's trying to depart in their life. You need humble hearts that gives you the heart that has the soil that can see 60 to 100 fold multiplication of what God wants to do in your life. We get the benefits of community when we're actively involved in community. We are called to do life together, to be on mission together, to support each other, to serve each other. Those that understand he's sovereign and I'm not. He's holy and I'm not. He's righteous when I'm not. That's where I experience the presence of God. That's when I experience the healing of God. That's when he revives purpose and will in my life. That's when I have a clear direction for my life. It's the humility to bow leads God to elevate. What's up, Bloom Church? Who's ready today? Come on. Man, I'm excited. We are in week six of our sermon series, Hearing God. Before I jump in, though, I do want to share something. I've been kind of wrestling with how to talk about this. But we are coming in. We're just weeks away from a very important election coming up. And you'll notice something if you've been at Bloom since the history of Bloom. I have never once told someone who or how to vote. I'm not going to tell you today who and how to vote. But I am going to tell you, be informed. Educate yourself on the things that matter and that is important. There is a lot of ambiguous language put in bills that leave things open for interpretation, okay? And there's a couple very important amendments. I want you to look at Amendment 3 and Amendment 7, okay? Both of those are very important for you to study and understand what they say. And also, when you're looking at a candidate... Understand policies matter. Which policies align with your values, your beliefs, and which policies do you feel like are going to have an impact not just on yourself, your children, their children, their children, generations to come. And this is the big thing that happens with a lot of people. They go, well, what can my little vote matter? I just read a study. 31 million registered Christians do not vote during election seasons. Elections are swayed by thousands of votes, not millions, which means you do have power, you do have authority. So listen to me, make sure you're informed so that you can make healthy, correct decisions. And let's, hey, listen to me, it's a constitutional right to vote. Let's go vote, amen? Amen, all right. And I might talk about that a little bit more, so I'm just be watching, okay, I'm gonna remind you, okay? All right, guys, we're in week six of our series, Hearing God. If you're new to this series, I've been talking and our team's been talking over the last several weeks, areas in our lives, how God speaks. Our main focus is God's a communicator. God wants to speak to his people. God wants to speak into your life. Our theme verse during this entire series is John 10, 27 says, my sheep, this is Jesus talking, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I've said this every week. This is not a suggestion. This is a definition of what it means to be a child of God, a disciple of Jesus, that he speaks to you. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows where you're at relevantly uh, to the relevant issues in your life. He knows what he wants for you. And if you listen and follow him, you walk into the will of God. That is for every single person I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care your age. I don't care where you came from. If you've accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, this is the promise for you. God wants to speak. And so over the last several weeks, we've talked about all the different areas. What does that look like? If you missed anything, I'm going to encourage you, go get plugged in. Understand what that looks like. Follow up. Get some of those sermons in your spirit. But last week, I kind of talked about how can you know God's will for your life? 
So we started wrestling with how do you know the will of God for your life and what does that look like? And I said, there's three things. Number one, you need the word of God in your life. We need the Bible in our life. Everything in your life has to be built on the foundation of God's word and the Bible. Anything in your life, any decision, any choice, any thought process that is opposite of that will not lead you into the will of God every time. But number two, we've also been gifted the Holy Spirit, which gives us the peace of God, gives us discernment, gives us wisdom, gives us counsel. We want the Holy Spirit leading and speaking to us. And number three, I talked about this last week, God has also designed you to be surrounded by godly counsel to speak into your life and really kind of help direct some of those things. Sometimes they help you flush out what God's speaking, give you a full picture of that. It's important. You need all three of these things. A lot of people will pick and choose one or two of them. They don't have all three. God designed us for all three of these to be important in our lives, to fully hear and flush out the word of God in our life. But today I want to talk about Something, I'm going to go a little bit deeper on a subject. This is a meaty subject I'm going to talk about. It's a hard subject to talk about. I'm going to encourage you to take notes today. But I want to really lean in on the peace of God. And I want you to understand where that peace comes from and how do you discover this. There is a peace God wants to give you, and it happens inside, not on the outside. And a lot of people, myself included, will try to convince yourself that you won't have peace unless outside external things in your life changes. And you'll have that picture in your mind. You know what it is. If, if you get X, Y, Z to happen, then all of a sudden you'll have peace. If that person changes, if that situation changes, if you get that raise, if you have something in your bank account, if you get that kind of toy, whatever you have in your mind that you're dreaming, thinking, wanting, you think if this external thing happens in life, then I'll have peace. That's not where peace, heavenly peace comes from. That is like taking ibuprofen to cure a disease. It may temporarily leave the, the symptoms, but it never fixes the problem. And you might temporarily like, oh yeah, if that person changes or that situation happened or, or something happens the way you want, you might temporarily have a little relief. It doesn't fix the problem. The problem is you've got to learn we live in a fallen world with fallen people and the only peace you can have in a fallen world is through the peace on the inside. And if you don't get that, you'll always walk with anxiety and stress in your life. It's why Paul encourages the church in Philippians. He says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank you for all he's done. Watch this. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. You notice what he says here. He's saying here, you can have peace beyond the rational things of this world beyond what people that don't know God experience, beyond what everybody else is freaking out and panicking about. You can discover peace, but it comes from God. You've got to understand it's a peace that God wants to give you. It's a gift from God. And so what does he challenge you? Not to worry about anything. Now that's not telling you not to be responsible in life. And it's not telling you you're not going to go through things in life. It's that you can go through life without being wrung dry from the anxiety and stress of this world. You could go through life without being crushed by the weight of this world. And the only way you can do that is if you have internal peace. And how God designed us to access that internal peace is he gave us this inner conviction, this inner wisdom. We have a spirit inside of us that wants to join with the Holy Spirit to direct and lead your life. And most people don't listen to that internal conviction because they have so much of their eyes on the external. And they put all of their hope on the external, they ignore the internal direction and conviction of God in their life. But God wants you to have peace. Paul says in Colossians, he says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule is important. You've got to let peace rule your life. You've got to submit to the authority of peace in your life. But how many people, we let stress rule our life. We let anxiety rule our life. We let situations rule our life or bitterness rule our life or what people have done rule our life or the tragedy we experience rule our life. And that is not the call of God. If you want peace of God, you've got to let peace be in charge of your life. 
You've got to let the will of God and the design of God be the utmost thing that you strive for, you desire, and you crave in all aspects of your life. And you're going to have to let the inner conviction, this thing on the inside I'm going to talk about today, help lead and guide you to the will of God in your life. So a lot of people say, well, what is this inner conviction or this inner witness? Well, an easy description of that is it's this internal sense of right and wrong that God gives every human being. And you know what I'm talking about. How many times you know when you're doing something, you know it's wrong, right? You know, uh, shouldn't be doing this. Or how many times you're doing something and you feel a peace about it and it doesn't quite always make sense. You're like, this is kind of risky, but I have peace, right? There's this internal conviction or wisdom the Holy Spirit gives you. Now, the problem is, is we don't always listen to it. How many times have you ignored that inner peace and then you felt the consequences of it and you felt this thought scream in your brain, why did I do that? 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 How many people have ever done that? Just me, right? Have you ever done, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I make that decision? Right, why did I, I did that a million times. I've done that a million times as an adult. Sometimes I'm like, I've let the words come out of my mouth. I'm like, yeah, that's my dad's word, right? You know, you're just trying to catch them, right? Especially before they get to my wife, right? No, <laughs> I'm in trouble. You can't catch words once they leave, okay? I made the decision when I was a kid, right? I've made some, some of those decisions that I knew were wrong, yet I talked myself into it. Like, I grew up in a day and age, young people, you don't understand what we went through as kids. We didn't have unlimited streaming services. We didn't have social media and smartphones. We watched drips of water go down a window to entertain us on car drives. And I didn't grow up in a family that had cable. We had local channels, three to five. Two of them were always fuzzy and never had anything good on. So guess what? When we were kids, we were bored all the time. Every moment of our life was bored. And when you're bored, you have to be creative to try to figure out how to entertain yourself. And when you're creative, you're curious. And what's the saying? Curiosity kills the cat. It also causes you to have spankings. I got a lot of space. I was curious all the time, okay? I remember one time, I was so bored, I decided to have this epic figure battle when I was in middle school. I was, my, my action figures, I'm battling, battling, battling. And I come across, I need a villain. And my sister, I don't know where she got this thing from, it was like a 1960s horror film clown. It was the creepiest thing in the world. And I thought, this is the best villain ever. So I get this clown, and I tie him up, and my mom had this hook in our living room in the corner where she would hang plants sometimes from, and she had a couch that was kind of catty corner up it. So I have him hung up on this hook. He's now, like, defeated, right? And all of a sudden, I thought, this isn't epic enough. How can I make this more epic? And in my little middle school brain, I start deciding he needs to be under a pit of fire, So I go get myself a plastic five-gallon bucket. I fill it with wood. I fill it with newspapers. And I go get the VHS camcorder because this thing's got to be videoed. And I light that bad boy on fire. The moment I lit it on fire, I knew I was in trouble. The flames were huge. They start consuming the clown. You thought it was creepy before. See the fringed hair. Nasty. All of a sudden, the bucket starts melting in the living room of my house. I am running to go get a big old pot of water. I dump it out. I save the house from burning down, except for there's a huge burned part of the carpet. But here's what I knew. My mom don't ever vacuum underneath that couch. I'm safe. And I was safe until we moved. Then I got to spank it, okay? My God! <laughs> But I knew inside, right? It's like, don't do it. This is dumb. Yet sometimes you can convince yourself. Now, that's a funny story, but we do that a lot of times in major situations of our life. We ignore it. We don't listen to it. And when we don't, it leads us in places we're not supposed to be. So a lot of people will say, well, how does this inner wisdom or conviction speak to you, right? And maybe this has happened to you. Maybe there's some areas that you've heard this inner witness in your life from that kind of speaks. Sometimes... It's an impression or a nudge. That's the things that are talking. Like sometimes you're feeling like, don't do it. This is not a good idea. Or, or I have peace, right? That's that nudge that comes up. Sometimes you get a thought. You ever had a thought in your mind, like a scripture 
or something to come to your mind and you go look and it's exactly what you needed. Or maybe you thought about a person and you haven't talked to them a lot and you call them and their life is spinning out of control and they're like, man, I needed you to call me. Or have you ever thought about someone and all of a sudden they call you? Right, that's the inner conviction sometimes connects with you. You know what, another way happens is sometimes you get this picture in your mind. Sometimes there's this vivid picture of something in your life or a person or a situation in your life and you clearly see a picture or sometimes it's not even just a picture, sometimes it's a moving image. Like sometimes you see a scene or a scenario and you feel like, okay, that's where I'm supposed to go or that's a conversation I'm supposed to have or maybe that's even a vision for my life that God's speaking into my life and all of a sudden you're, you're getting a picture, a moving picture or scene in your life that happens. Sometimes God speaks through a prophetic word. Sometimes God gives you a prophetic statement or thought for yourself or for someone else. Sometimes God sends someone else to speak a prophetic word in your life. Paul says in Corinthians, he says, there's spiritual gifts given to each of us so we can help each other. One person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Others translate say prophetic words or prophecy. Another same spirit gives the message of special knowledge. That sometimes God gives you a direct word prophetically from someone else. Sometimes God speaks through dreams. Now, not all dreams are God's dreams, okay? Sometimes we get some crazy dreams. They're not from God, all right? Sometimes they're just the Chinese food you ate the night before. <laughs> but sometimes I've woken up in the middle of the night with an idea about a problem I was dealing with that I couldn't have or no clarity. And all of a sudden, God in my dream will give me an idea. And I'll, I'll write up and put it in my phone. Or sometimes I'll get an idea or, or a vision for something I'm supposed to do. That God speaks sometimes through that. In Joel, when it's prophesying about the time of Jesus, the time of the church, watch what he says. After doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will do what? They're going to prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit, even on servants, men and women alike. That God wants to prophesy. God wants to give you vision. God wants to have dreams be unveiled to you. Like, like God wants to speak to you. There's ways that that inner conviction wants to speak. Another one, and this happens a lot, is you get this check or this caution in your spirit. Like, have you ever had like this check, like something's wrong with someone you love? Or maybe you're walking into an environment, you go, this isn't healthy, or I, I shouldn't be here, right? It's like almost like your spidey senses are going. Or as a parent, have you ever felt that about your kid? You're like, I need to call my kid right now. Or I need to check on my kid right now. I need, I need what's going on with my kid. Because you felt something was off. I remember one time my mom was, I was three years old, I remember. And she was doing a home project. She was lacquering her bed. And she said that she took a break and she was on the phone. And she was eating. And all of a sudden she said, in the middle of the phone call, I go, whoa, where's my son? She's like, I had this check, like caution, something's not right. So she goes, look for me. And all of a sudden she noticed that her door is locked and shut. She goes to open the door. Michael, open the door. And I go, I can't, Mom. I'm busy. <laughs> right? Michael, open the door. I'm busy. Right? So she started taking my little chelky self and she'd take a little sucker and stick it under the door and pull it out. Right? Stick it under the door. Pull it out. Finally, I wanted that sucker. I opened the door. Next thing she does, she opens the, I open the door. I am covered head and toe in lacquer. Every wall is painted in lacquer. Every floor is painted in lacquer. Everything but the bed is lacquer. Okay? Right, but she got a check in her spirit. Like sometimes, parents, if you get a check about your kids, respond to it, reach out to it. God sometimes gives you these a check. Now let me give you some clarity. All of this has to be fully in alignment with the word of God. God will never give you a dream, prophetic word, a picture, an image, a check. If it's out of alignment with the word of God, it's not from God, right? Everything stands on the word of God. R.C. Sproul says it like this. He said that the church is walking in weakness because it forgot that the power is in the authority of the Bible, not in programs or initiatives. That sometimes we can try to initiate or program our way out of the authority of the word of God. We want everything to be locked into the word of God. And we need God to lead us. Here's the biggest problem we deal with today. We have unlimited choices to choose from. And it's like a buffet in this world and we feel like we can choose anything and everything we want. That's not the way God designed us. 
Like we are meant to not have unlimited choices, but God's choice. And when you have unlimited choices, you miss the greatest things in your life. Like I miss some of the greatest joys I had when I was a kid. Maybe I'm just being nostalgic, right? But remember when I told you, we didn't have streaming services. So there was some beautiful things throughout a week that you couldn't wait for. How many kids remember you couldn't wait for TGIF? Come on, the greatest block of TV programming for kids ever, right? Or maybe you ever came across on TV a movie right when it was starting. Come on, not midway through. And you're like, I've been wanting to see this. Or the best words ever was when your mom or dad said, we going to Blockbuster and you can pick out a movie for the weekend. And you went to Blockbuster and you want to know the best feeling? It's when you saw the movie you wanted and it wasn't on the shelf, but then you went to the return bin. Come on, somebody. And there it was. And they were kind and they rewind. Come on. And you got yourself that movie. Come on. Right? Now, come on, that's the best feeling ever. I mean, I used to get so excited. We don't know what that joy is. Now we have thousands of options. And how many times you get on Netflix, you're like, nothing to watch, nothing to watch, nothing to watch. Like literally millions of things at your fingertip. And yet you still feel like, I don't got nothing to watch. Why? Because we're not programmed to have unlimited choices. We are programmed to be led by healthy choices, God's choices. We are meant to walk in alignment with his will for our life. But if we don't understand that, we're gonna make the wrong decisions. And here's what happens. Here's how most people make decisions. You wanna know how most people make decisions? Number one, the first way they make decisions is they'll, they'll say, what feels good to me? Sin. If it feels good, I'll do it. If it feels good, I'm gonna give into it. If I want it, I'm gonna take it. If I want it, I'm gonna do it. Listen to me very clearly. God wants good for your life. And God is good himself. But God does not want temporary satisfaction for your life. He wants long-term health for your life. And you've got to understand that. That's why the Bible says, you've got to taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge for him. Notice what he's saying. He's saying, you've got, the ball's in your court. You've got to taste to see if God's good. You've got to pursue God's will. You've got to want God in your life. You've got to register that. Sin craves to be satisfied no matter the cost. It doesn't care if it costs you your character. It doesn't care if it costs you relationships. It doesn't care if it costs you in your integrity. It wants to be satisfied no matter the cost. Holiness desires the will of God no matter the cost, which means you'll die to those cravings and you'll die to your selfishness and you'll die to these feelings because you want God's will beyond anything else for your life. You gotta understand you're gonna wrestle with this. Another thing we wrestle with is this, what we think we'll lose. We walk around with fear. How many people ever have FOMO, the fear of missing out, right? And we'll convince ourselves of God's will. And we'll convince ourselves that this is God's design based on our preferences. The most saddest thing to me as a pastor, and I see this so many times, most people will kill the will of God for their life because they chase man's ambition over God's design. I see too many godly men and women that will trade their callings for the ambitions of their flesh. And I've seen so much anointing left on the table because they chase the things of this world, not the things of God. You've got to understand God's got a design for your life. And listen to me, if you're walking in alignment with God, it is the greatest place to be. The third way we make a decision is this. What we think we need, it's what we compromise. I had a pastor say this to me once. He says, what you compromise to get, you'll have to always compromise to keep. If you keep cutting corners, and if you keep skating by, and if you don't have integrity, he says, you are gonna miss this, this life that God has for you, because you're going to have to keep keeping up with this facade. And the most stressed out, anxious people in this world are the people that have to keep on keeping up with their lies. This imposter syndrome. It's exhausting living one life. Try living double life. That's an exhausting place to live. Have integrity. The fourth way sometimes we make decisions is we try to get it quickly. It's this drive. I heard it said like this, flesh drives you, but the spirit leads you. There is a 100% chance of success 
if you're walking in the will of God, those statistics don't match if you're walking in the will of this world. And so many times we want everything to happen now, not in the patience and in his timing. That is not the call of God. Listen to me very clearly. We treat things that are finite as they're infinite. And we chase things that are temporary like they're permanent. Money is not infinite. The praise of people is not infinite. They will literally dissipate the moment you leave this world. Yet we treat money and praise and affirmation like they're eternal. And we discard the eternal like it's temporary. And then we wonder why we live this conflicted life. Because we're trying to be time travelers in a world we're called to be present in. We live always in the slavery of our past and what has happened to us and what's going on or what we missed up or what do we miss or what or we're always looking for. I need this happen. I need to be this. I need to live in this. And we never just live in the now. The key to favor of God and the will of God is to take God one day at a time. And that is so hard because it's against your human nature. But we are not called to be citizens of this world, but citizens of heaven. We are not called to be led by our flesh, but led by the spirit. We are called to be light of the world, which means we are supposed to look different, be motivated by things that are different, and behave differently. If we were called to look like this world, we would never stand out like light. We would blend in like darkness. That's not our calling. Jesus said it like this. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles are enough for today. It's why Jesus in the daily prayer says, every single day you need to ask God for your daily bread. God, I just need enough strength and enough provision to get through this day. I just need enough wisdom to get through this day. It's why Jesus says you're supposed to daily take up your cross and die to yourself, which means daily you have to remind yourself, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself and I'm not gonna keep living in the past. I'm gonna give God today. God, let today be honoring to you. Let the life I live be honoring to you. It's why in the Old Testament, he gave the Israelites manna every day because God wants you to walk in step with him daily. You will never walk in step with God daily if you're not walking in step with the inner conviction in your life. Your sin, your preferences will either run ahead or run behind, never walk in the present. That's why the writer of Hebrews said it like this. He says, through faith and what? Patience, you inherit what has been promised. That when you have the faith that you're fully locked in on the Holy Spirit's leading and you have the patience that we trust his season and timing more than our preferences, that's when we inherit the promises of God. That's when we walk in the fullness of God. You need both. We were designed to be fully in connection with God daily. We were designed to be fully connected with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God connecting with us. Paul says in Romans, he says, for his spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, joins with our spirits that affirm that we are God's children. That when you walk in alignment with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden you start realizing you're not just a face in the crowd. You're not just a name on the roll call. That you're not just supposed to stumble through this world, but when you understand you are a child of God, you know that God's got a plan for you. He wants good for you. He's got promises for you. There's an inheritance for you, which means you want to bear witness with the Holy Spirit to walk in full alignment with him. Chapters earlier, in chapter two, Paul says it like this. He says, they demonstrate that God's laws is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts, either accuse them or tell them you're doing right. That we are designed to have this moral compass in us that gives us these warnings that, hey, hey, you're drifting or you're in alignment. Hey, You've got this morality. God's promise, his design is on your life. Listen to his heedings and callings and warnings. It kind of reminds me of my wife's car. My wife has one of those fancy cars, right? Like iPad for a screen, right? I got the iPhone 1 for a screen on my truck, okay? She got like an iPad screen, okay? And it's got all these little safety features, right? If you start reversing in my wife's car, and there's an object back there, it'll literally, if you don't hit the brake, it'll stop it for you. It'll start beep, 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 and stop, 
right? Or if you're driving too fast and a car stopped in front of you, beep, 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 starts alerting you, right? And it's causing you to stop. And if you try to go past those warnings, what are you going to do? You're going to crash. You're going to hit something. That's the Holy Spirit. It's these warnings in your life telling you, I don't want you to hit things in this world and crash. I don't want you to walk through tension. I don't want you to walk out of the will of God. I want you walking fully in alignment with God. It's exactly what Paul was telling his mentee, Timothy, when he says it like this. He says, the purpose of my instructions is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. That God wants you to be filled with love and goodness and peace. But how do you get there? you got to have a pure heart. You know what a pure heart is? The highest form of intention. God, I want your will, not my will. I want your kingdom. I'm going to build your kingdom. I'm not going to build the kingdom of me. And I want good conscience or clear conscience. You know how you get good conscience, clear conscience? That you are listening. You are prayerfully, when you're making decisions, listening for the Holy Spirit's wisdom and discernment. You don't make decisions without praying and seeking Holy Spirit to speak to you. And it causes you to have a genuine faith because you know God's got your best interest at heart. And if God's for you, who can be against you? And you want his will for your life more than anything else. But if you don't, watch what Paul goes on to say to Timothy. Some people have missed this. For they've turned away from these things and they spend their time in meaningless discussions. You want to know the greatest litmus test whether or not you're listening to the Holy Spirit's leading with a pure heart and clear conscience and genuine faith? Just listen to the words that you speak. Your words tell you what you think about a situation in your life. Your words tell you what you think about a person in life. Your words tell you what you think about your future. And if you're speaking negatively, or if you're speaking with all anxiety, or if you're speaking with all fear, or you're speaking with angerness and bitterness, if you're speaking with all this, guess what? You're not walking with the Holy Spirit's leading. You're letting your flesh and your anxiety lead you in life. It's very evident in your words. The Bible says, from your heart, your mouth speaks. So if you're speaking those things, it's because there's something inside of you that's disrupted, and you need Holy Spirit to come in. And parents, let me give you a little little caveat here. Your kids will tell you exactly what's going on in their life. You just got to listen intently to their words. And they might drop a little nugget here and drop a nugget here and drop a little thing here. If you're listening to their words, you can hear where their heart's at. Your heart speaks. But if you just keep ignoring it and you keep missing it and you don't want to listen to it, Paul goes on to say in verse 19, watch what he says. He says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience. And as a result, their faith has been what? Shipwrecked. It causes you to crash. It causes pain in your life. It causes tension in your life if you just keep ignoring that conscience, keep ignoring that. So let's get practical. I want to land the plane with some practical things. And the first thing I want to answer, write this in your notes. What does the Bible say about our conscience? Because there's some conscious things that come up in our lives. And what does the Bible say about it? And I'm going to give you a lot of scripture addresses. I don't have time to read them all, but I put them there because I want you to go look at them yourself, okay? But the first is, and this is a very common one, we get stricken or guilty. It argues against us. What do I mean? Sometimes you sin. Sometimes you make a bad choice. And what happens? You get this conviction inside of you going, that's not a good decision. You shouldn't have done that. That's unhealthy. The bad news is we all sin. The good news is we could repent and God always forgives. So sometimes the Holy Spirit tells you that was wrong. You need to repent and ask God to forgive you. That happens. But you know what else kind of messes with our conscience? Sometimes we have this weak, defiled, or wounded conscience. We're damaged. And that's where sometimes you've had a pain or tragedy in your past. Or someone wronged you in your past. Something bad happened to you. And now you look at the world through the lens of your trauma, not through the lens of God's direction and guidance. You see every person like that one person that harmed you. You're scared about every similar event because of one event caused pain. Maybe a person in church or a pastor hurt you, and now you're leery of all the things of God. And so you constantly look at the world through the lens of your pain or your trauma, and so your conscience is now distorted because of that. 
and you've not let God heal that. Or maybe another one is this, it's seared, Timothy says, or desensitized. It's where you've ignored that conviction so long, you don't hear it any longer. That you knew it was wrong at first, but you kept with that lifestyle choice or those decisions to the point where you don't even hear it anymore. And you've now convinced yourself it's, it's okay. It's what I'm supposed to be. And there's a lot of people with, with unbiblical lifestyle choices that have convinced themselves it's what God has for them. And they'll say it like this, well, God wants me to be happy. Listen to me, God does want you to be happy, but you're not gonna find happiness apart from his will. You never will. And you might ibuprofen your way through life, but you never healed that disease. And this is also what happens with a lot of narcissists, because narcissists can't ever see wrong in their life. So they're so deaf to that conviction in their life, right? And lastly, sometimes we're corrupted. And that's just because we have no belief. We completely reject the Bible. We completely reject God. We completely reject the moral morality of God and the things that he calls for us. The Bible talks about this. It's like a parable. It's like God sows the word, the seeds on hard path. And the path is so hard, the birds come and eat the seeds so it cannot take root. And the Bible says that the seeds are the word of God, the Bible. That hard path is your heart and the, and the birds are the devil. And so the devil comes and takes some of the promises and the goodness from you because you don't even have a heart to receive it from God. And so we walk with this distorted conscience that we don't get to walk in the will of God and the direction of God. But that's not the goal. What's the goal? The goal is to have a clear conscience. Not perfect, we're gonna make mistakes, but constantly open to God speaking, God uh, leading, God convicting, God directing our lives. That we are prayerfully, daily locked in to God that helps us navigate this world. Now here's the question that's gonna come up, number two. How do you keep your conscience clear? So how do I keep my conscience clear so I can be open to God directing our lives. How do we get this? And you know what you gotta do? You gotta guard your gates. You gotta guard yourself from what you're letting into your life. Because what you constantly let into your life, whether it is things you are inviting in or unhealthy people you're inviting in will shape your life. What are those things? Number one, your eyes. What are you looking at? The Bible says the eyes of your heart Your eyes are the windows of your souls. If your eyes are good, your soul is good. If your eyes are unhealthy, your soul is unhealthy. A lot of times we think, what's the worst can happen? I can watch whatever I want. I can consume whatever I want to consume. And it has no effect on me. I try to tell this to my teenagers all the time. I'm not telling you not to watch it because I'm a mean, overly ruled, oriented person. I'm trying to protect your heart. I'm trying to protect your mind. You can't watch that stuff and it be healthy in your heart and mind. And some of us have become so desensitized because everything is normal in this world that we think everything is okay for us. And we will we'll say this things, well, I can watch it and it not affect me. Guess who would tell you that? Definitely not Jesus, but the one that doesn't want you to walk in the will of Jesus. Definitely not the one that says you're a citizen of heaven, the one that wants you to think you're a citizen of this world. Care about your eyes. The second thing is, your ears. What are you listening to? Listen to me very clearly. The most divisive, demonic thing is gossip. And gossip, the Bible says, tastes sweet, but it corrupts and kills. And this is the one thing that we listen to more than anything else. We listen to the negative talk and the gossip of people and we wonder why we start hating people and we're divided and we're fighting and we tension and this arguing and we're always skeptical of people in this world. It's because our ears have been opened to the wrong words. Number three, your hearts. What are your appetites and your desires? Are you craving the kingdom of you? Are you craving your vices and your urges? Are you craving the thing? And those are the things that all you want. And listen to me very clearly, this thing right here, your heart cannot be protected by yourself. It has to be protected by surrounding yourself with accountability partners that are going the same place you are wanting to go. And we will buy this lie, I can fight through my pain, I can fight through my temptations, I can fight through my urges all alone. That is not God's design, that is not the will of God, and it is 
opposite of what the word of God says you need in your life. So what happens if you stumble in any of three of these areas? Confess. When you make a mistake, confess to God. That's how you're forgiven. But James says you gotta confess to one another. That's how you're healed. And there's a lot of Christians that are heaven bound, but broken. Because they want to confess to God, but they never want to confess to their accountability people. And they believe this lie, I can keep my skeletons hidden in the closet of my life. And those skeletons haunt you. And they will haunt you, they will haunt your thoughts, they will haunt your desires, they will haunt your mind. And sooner or later, those skeletons will spill out into the living room of your life when you least expect it. And they will cause much more damage. And the devil knows this. So the devil speaks shame into you and condemnation into you and starts telling you this idea. If you tell people, they will think differently of you. They won't want a relationship with you. They won't love you anymore. They will write you off. And the reason the devil does that is because shame is just like mold. It grows in the darkest places of our lives. And those dark secrets start consuming you if you don't learn the beauty of confession you got to confess. And the third thing you got to do is stay humble and holy. My pastor, one of my pastors says it like this. He says, when you stay humble and holy, you're on a crash course for greatness in life. When you can stay humble, God, not my will, but your will be done. And it is only through your power. And you can walk in the holiness, God, I don't want the things of this world. I want to look and reflect like you. But listen to me, to walk in the holiness of God, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it like this, costly grace is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin and it's grace because it justifies the sinner. If you want to walk in the grace of God, you're going to have to surrender your life to God. That's going to cost you something. And it's also going to have, you're going to have to understand, we call sin what it is. It's sin. It's not compromise. It's not blending into culture. It is what it is. But there's grace because we only get it from God. We don't get it from our works. We get it from him. That's why Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take your cross daily. Follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. You want to walk with the guidance of the Holy Spirit? You want to walk with the joy beyond understanding and peace beyond understanding? If you want to walk in the will of God, you got to humble yourself under the sovereignty and the authority of God and strive to be an image and reflection of Him. But here's the kicker you got to give your life to Him fully. But there's some people in this room right now that have never given their life to Jesus. You're in this room right now, maybe you're new to your church, you're new to this faith, but you feel in your spirit that conviction saying, you need to be what God wants for you. Or there's some people in this room right now that you used to have a relationship with Jesus, but you've walked away, and your life is not walking in alignment with God. You know your life's not pleasing God, and it's time to come back home. And you may say, well, how do you do that? It's easy. The Bible says all you have to do is confess. Just say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I need you a part of my life. But also the Bible says you got to believe he is who he says he is. He's not riding in a grave somewhere. He's the resurrected king sitting at the right hand of God. And when you pray, you better believe he responds. And you may say that sounds way too easy. Good. Grace was not meant to be hard, just chosen. Here God's already chosen you. You just got to choose him. So right now I'm asking every head to bow. Please no moving around. It's the most important thing we do. Take your hand and place over your heart, symbol of your soul. And repeat after me. Dear Jesus. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all my sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I matter. And I give you my life. Holy Spirit, move right now. Every head bowed. Nobody looking around. If you made that commitment today for the first time or recommitted your life to Jesus I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Two reasons. Number one, we're not ashamed of Jesus in this place. And I'm ready to celebrate you're part of my family of faith. But number two, I want to pray for you this week. 
I want to see your hands in my heart and mind as I'm praying. So on the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised if you accepted Jesus in your life for the first time or recommitted it. One, don't be afraid. Two, we going to celebrate. Three, get your hands up right now. Thank you, Jesus. See your hand. Thank you, Jesus. See your hand. Thank you, Jesus. See your hand. See your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Keep your hands. See your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Come on, church. Get excited. I got three, four hands right there in the back. Three, four hands right there in the back. Come on, church. Get excited. Heaven got bigger. Hell got smaller. Amen. Thank you for watching. And if you gave your heart to Jesus, can I tell you right now, I am so excited for you. And this church wants to be in your corner. We actually want to resource you so you can grow in your faith. So if you text the number below, we actually want to send you a free digital copy of the book, Following Jesus. It's going to help answer some questions you may have and give you some next steps you need to take to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Again, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed today's message, will you give me a favor? Will you like this video? Comment below, maybe share it with a friend. And don't forget, we go live every single Sunday. And until next time, pray God's peace.